have to be quick now. Um, okay, so Web3.js, which is like a very um, core important part of the whole ecosystem. A lot of people use it. Uh, it's totally about me. I build a content management system, open source libraries, worked as a web designer for like 15 years or so, uh, wrote a book about Meteor, um, and built the Mist uh, browser and the Ethereum wallet, how it is today. Now our team is a big bigger than, than just me and Alex. Uh, we also have Ram, Everton, and uh, Luca as part of the team. If you're somewhere here, maybe you want to stand up, or you're probably standing already on the side. There he is, there's Everton. Um, so, and Ethereum, uh, JavaScript API, or Web3.js, how it's called. So, I contributed to this, as you can see here. This is kind of like the graph of, of uh, GitHub contributions. I'm there in the middle, this green figure. But it was originally started by Jeffrey, who wanted to have a simple way to uh, access or like deal with the node in JavaScript, writing simple scripts to interact with the node, building little dApps. Later then joined Marek, he took over the project and basically built m most part of it what is currently the Web3.js. I joined like almost two years ago and helped refactoring a lot of this under the hood code, improving the API and adding additions. I rewrote or restructured the RPC endpoints to make them more readable, more understandable. And basically because Marek is now part of ETHCore and working on parity, I'm maintaining Web3.js. We have also other contributors, Alex there too. <laughs> um, and a lot of others actually who also helped out. Um, so the main reason of Web3.js is because the node only understa understands JSON RPC. So basically what JavaScript or what Web3.js does is it translates this JSON RPC uh, code uh, calls where you send a JSON object into something you can actually easily use in JavaScript and it looks like uh, calling simple JavaScript objects. The EVM itself only understands bytecode. And that's not easy for a JavaScript developer, and that's probably not easy for most people, and uh, it's not really human readable. So basically what Web3.js helps is translating these function names through what we call the ABI, the application binary interface, to something which the EVM understands. And to do that, you basically take the you take the uh, function, the transfer, including its parameters, you SHA-3 that, and you take the first four bytes, and this is becomes the function name. And then you add the first parameter, and you add the second parameter. And this you send over JSON RPC to the, uh, to the node, and this way the node understands what to do in the smart contract. And basically, Web3.js in the contract object does all of this for you. So you only have to deal with JavaScript objects, they look like uh, normal standard functions, but under the hood it translates to this ABI. In Web3.js you also have a bunch of other um, tools and utility functions you can use in the application, but because it grew over the time, it's quite messy right now, it's, it's, it grows, it grew just over time with a lot of people influencing the decisions, and that's why there's time for new Web3.js. <laughs> So the whole idea is that it's um, um, like the way it grew, it became to a point where it's, it's influenced by so many sites that it's not really easy to use for JavaScript developers. And um, there are certain parts which actually doesn't, don't make sense as a, uh, as a JavaScript uh, library. And it became clear to me that this needs to re have a refactor at some point and the community also asked for a lot of features and things and want to have things changed and that's basically what I'm right now working on is like making the new Web3.js. Web so it, it will be a refactor, it's not built from scratch and it will not completely change but it will have core pieces changed and probably one of the main one is that the communication will be socket based. So currently everything is done in HTTP requests and this will still work, 
but it will not st work for everything because uh, of the nature of uh, what we do, what I will show later, that we have subscriptions, and subscriptions need sockets. So you can either use the IPC socket, which is like your local socket you, you use to talk to your node on your computer, or you can use web sockets. So before we had this concept of the filter, and this concept was rather confusing for many people. So basically you, what you would have created a filter watching for log events, and then you watch it, and then you get result or the log at some point. But this whole, like, uh, it's not very descriptive, and it's also uh, in the JavaScript world not common to do it this way. And um, it confused people because they thought, hey, I can filter for a transaction, uh, for an address, and I get all the transactions of this address. That was also my first understanding of that function. But that's kind of like wrong, right? It's, it's not clear and makes no sense like this. So the real way of doing this actually is subscribing to something. And with the new logs, it's actually even technically working as a subscription. So you basically just subscribe to logs, you pass in an, uh, another options object, which can be the topics in this case, and then you just wait for the data changes to arrive. Um, Web3.js right now is like a big bulky uh, app library you have to use if you want to use Web3.js. In the future, this will be more uh, split in separate packages where you also can require the, the, the large package Web3, which, we have, which will have everything you need for your dApp, or you only need the utility functions, or you only need the ether functions, um, or only the swarm functions. And one big part of the refactor is the uh, way how we call functions. So we currently had this way of calling uh, function synchronous, which is a terrible idea because in JavaScript, when you have synchronous functions, your interface freezes. The assumption was that the responses from the node will be so, so small that you never have a problem with that, but reality teaches us that that is actually a problem, and it's also not the way you can do that in JavaScript. So from the future on, everything will be based on promises, but there's this special case in Ethereum that one action can ha have multiple end results. I combine that with events, and uh, you basically get a promised event back. <laughs> so you can chain it, and it uh, then will be called once the transaction is mined, but you can also um, listen for specific events, for example, when you want to get the transaction hash or like the mind event. And in the future, we could add more events. We could add, for example, a confirmation event or an, an event for each single confirmation up to 12 confirmations. And we can think of way more things we can actually look for uh, on what happens on the Ethereum network with your action you did. The same goes then for other functions. The question here is, do we need like uh, the events here too? That's to be seen, but it at least keeps consistency. Deploying contracts, um, the main change is that actually you now instantiate the new contract object using the new, new keyword. Um, you then have a deploy function, and this will be the same as send transaction. You basically just get the, um, the promise resolved once the transaction is mined, and you actually have the contract address object, uh, the con contract address, and the contract object attached with the address. And you also have this event. So basically, you have two ways of doing it. And there's also a debate going on, should we add still callbacks or not? When you're calling methods, so that's actually a, a better way than we did it before. So you basically will call the method. You give it all the parameters. And beca because before, we basically mixed the parameters with the transaction object, we had the problem that you could never pass a struct in as a parameter object because Web3.js would have detected this as being the options object for your send transaction. Uh, so doing it this way, it allows us to basically pass any kind of uh, parameter and it would be clearly only a parameter. And then you get an ob object back which has different functions like estimate gas, which gives you the gas estimation for that kind of call encode, which encodes you the, um, the ABI for that kind of call, which you could then use and pass it into a contract, for example, if you have a proxy contract, or you calling the function or sending the transaction for the function. And this, again, will return a promise or an uh, and, uh, events. 
You also will have other utility functions which you right now don't expose, uh, but they're ne very necessary if you want to build more complex applications and you want to do things yourself. Means you can encode, like you get this JSON interface just of a method and you can encode the whole uh, thing. If you want to do this in the contract object, you already have the encode functions function. You will also have a constructor function which you cannot call or send transactions to, but which you can also encode. And um, there's more to come, for example, like passing instructs, returning structs from smart contracts. And I would like to get feedback and ideas. So my main idea is. Um, doing everything which is currently in the 1.0 milestone and uh, working through it and doing it this way and then releasing an alpha, getting feedback from the community and uh, then we can go on and release at some point a Web3.js uh, 1.0 which everybody is happy with and which will be hopefully the only breaking changes for the next few years. <laughs> but there will be a few breaking changes, but necessary ones. So your feedback is welcome. The GitHub channel and the issues, ideally, and um, let's talk about what's what could be next. Thanks. Thank you, Fabian. Did you want to take a question? Did you want to take a question? I can take uh, questions, yeah, if I have time. Yeah, Any sure. questions for Fabian? Any questions? Come on. Uh, yeah. Perfect, <laughs> microphone. <laughs> uh, with the next rewrite, do you plan on utilizing TypeScript to help um, make it cleaner and help to, to check for standard bugs and things like that? Yeah, it would make sense, right? Um, um, I want to keep it as minimal as possible. If other people want to build on top like something like a TypeScript compiling uh, version, yeah, that, that makes sense. But I want to keep it as like a bare minimum uh, ja library. Otherwise, it's getting opini opinionated again and then uh, there's a bunch of discussions discussions and other people would then use CoffeeScript and everybody wants to do use something else. So I stick with the pure JavaScript. Anyone else? Okay, well thank you very much Fabian. <laughs> <laughs>